WDON is proud to present our latest podcast, The Colors of Sound. Our mission is to create a safe space for community members from around the world to share their personal stories. Listen on all streaming platforms or on our podcast station, WDON1204.com. The Colors of Sound podcast. Discover how much we have in common. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Colors of Sound podcast. My name is Timothy Stone Dancer Coleman, and I'm very honored and privileged to have a guest with us today that is a citizen of the United States who is uh, flexing his right to be an agent of change. We have the incomparable Mr. Larry Acevedo from California, who is running for president in our 20, upcoming 2024 election. And I can't tell you how excited I am to have him on the show. Uh, I've never met anybody who's run for public office before, so I feel like this is a great time for us to communicate and just have a regular old conversation about, you know, the most important job on the planet. So, sir, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, how are you doing today? Thank you. Pretty good. I'm glad you asked. Glad to be here. Thank you for taking the time to do this. This is an important time in our country. People really need our support, and we need to show up and do that. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. So, sir, for anybody who isn't aware of who you are, uh, I want to start with a quote that has been uh, potentially attributed to a couple of different people. I read it from Stephen Covey, um, but the, the quote is, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And one of the things that I feel with political office, with, you know, folks that are, that are running for these types of things is that, you know, the way we get the sound bites as just regular citizens, regular human beings on the couch with a bag of chips and we're watching what's going on on the news, all we ever get are uh, sound bites that are kind of stacked together uh, that equate to a producer or an editor's point of view, uh, depending on which type of station you're watching. So for all fairness, I would love to start with where are you from? And as you think about your childhood, what are some of the core values that you grew up with that you feel make you the best choice to be our next president of the United States? Well, I'm glad you asked that. I'm right here in the heart of California, the center of the San Joaquin Valley, where lots of lots of agriculture products and services take place that we provide throughout our nation and around the world. Well, I come up hard, come from a single parent home. My mama raised me and my two brothers, okay? My dad split on us. That's just the way it is sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that made my mom real tough. And she was too proud for welfare. She had a little ranch outside town. Mm -hmm. She went to local auction yards, bought farm animals, goats, sheep, pig, cattle, anything, any animal she could get her hands on, bring it home for her and her boys to raise. And we did. We took care of them seven days a week. We had to water and feed those animals before school and after school. And not only that, we took it a step farther. She said, nah, -uh, boys. She put us in 4-H. We started training and showing them animals all over California. Wow. Sacramento, Fresno, clear up to Cow Palace, where the biggest show, with one of the biggest show places in California, and won many trophies and ribbons along the way. You better believe it. She kept her boys busy and made <laughs> us be responsible. And by doing that, it taught us the value of hard work mm -hmm. and how important it is how important family members it is, regardless if you're short one parent or not, how important it is to stick together and help one another through good and bad times. That's very important nowadays. A lot of people don't stick around and, and tough it out and stick to what they're supposed to be doing and help one another. One little thing happens and psh, they're gone. That's right. But anyway, went through, finished high school, finished elementary, went on and even went up to FFA show for, for nine years, finished high school, then I started working at the cotton gins. Started as yard man, right? Okay. Watering down the yard. And then they said, all right, well, what else you know? And then I started driving the tractor, towing the cotton trailer, lining them up in alphabetical order. You know, this mm -hmm. farmer's got so many of that sort of thing. And then just through dedication, I was I was I was a good listener. It takes a good listener. I was a very good listener. I learned fast and I paid attention. Mm -hmm. So within three years, believe it or not, 
I made it all the way up to assistant ginner. I was actually making and weighing cotton bales and running the cotton gin within three years. Time I was 21 years old, I was running the cotton gins for our cotton gin farmers out here in the San Juan, central San Joaquin Valley. I got weigh master certificates, you can look it up. I weighed, measured all their bales, bagged them and ginned their cotton. And then also in the off season, I worked for them, built some modulo pallets. That's when they used to put pallets instead of the pellets now. Mm -hmm. And then there was still some time off. So I worked in the tomato station and the tomato canners, forklift operator, worked on the lime, canned them, bagged them. And then there was still a little bit of gap and unemployment didn't pay much. And I was still young and ambitious. I said, well, I'm ready. I want more. You know, I just couldn't stop there. I said, well, I, I want to learn a trade, something. So I started looking at auto diesel technical trade schools. Mm. So there I went right off to Arizona to a technical and trade school. Went over there and spent two years of my life. I mastered the art of auto and diesel. I got an associate's degree. Got just about straight A's and everything. Studied my butt off. Came back. And then by then, you know, we were growing and gone, so the animals were gone. But my mom still lived there, and the old barn was just deserted. So I cleaned out that old barn, asked her, hey, Ma, can I start my own shop? I want to fix cars and trucks. I want to put my new knowledge together. Mm -hmm. Sure, son, go ahead. So cleaned out that old barn, got some plywood and paint, fixed it up, poured some cement myself, did all the work. My brothers helped me. I had two other brothers, one younger one, he milked some cows. But I forgot mm -hmm. to mention that I milked cows through the year for my grandpa and stuff during the school. But mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stay busy <laughs> besides feeding the cattle. But anyway, um, got that barn fixed up, started working on autos, trucks, fixing just about anything that moved or ran. <clears throat> so on the, going to town one day, I seen an old farmer. He had some old fertilizer trucks for sale. You know, he didn't want to mess with them no more. So, well, I knew how to fix them. I was ambitious. So we bought them. They were all beat up, two of them. So we took them home, talked to my mom brothers first. Hey, you know, I know how to fix them. You want to do this? Ah. So they thought about a few days. They said, all right, let's do it. So we brought them old rusty buckets home, and I just started tearing out the old parts, putting new parts in them, painted them up. And then, you know, after when cotton season comes around, as soon as the cotton comes out, they want to put the manure in the field. So there was a seasonal business. But we started with two trucks. And then from there, next year, three trucks, and then four trucks. And then we started delivering. Then we got highway trucks to go to the dairies with a loader and clean them out. They out the dairy. So load it, haul it, then spread it. So after truck, after truck. So then about, about eight years went by this. So we had a little bit, we got big enough, so a little bit of money left over. So then I said, well, my brothers, you take over the trucks. And me and mom, that's when in 08, when Obama was in office, mm -hmm. the housing market crashed. And, if you had money, they were giving houses away for 25,000 bucks. If you had the money, you know, they, people got mad. They beat them up, you know, because they lost them. So they really tore up the sheetrock and they tore up the toilet. They really screwed them up. So we got some houses pretty cheap, but don't get me wrong. We had to really work hard. To, mm -hmm. So I already knew my auto and diesel, you know, electronics and stuff and plumbing because you had hydraulics on the truck. So the same technical, my same mechanical experience paid off into the homes, mm -hmm. you know, so I learned how to wire homes. It was just a little bit more dangerous, a little more hot. <laughs> so I learned right. electricity, right? Learned 110 and 220. And I, you know, I already knew how to do cement work, learned the sheet rock work. And then I learned how to roof and I learned how to plumb. Really so basically I learned that because wow. wow. the more work you do yourself. Yeah. My mom's, you know, if you go hire a plumber electrician, they want 23. Uh oh, you ain't hire nobody. You get in there, you grab that wire, you turn the power, you figure it out yourself. If you wanted to, you wanted to buy these homes, right, son, right. you fix them up. I ain't spending no more money. We done bought that home. <laughs> you figure it out. So right. I did. And I become a really good contractor, believe it or not. Absolutely. And what's good about that is we hired any youth that was in trouble or ran away or any use like that were got out of the rehabilitation centers or adults and homeless people. I would hire anybody that wanted to work. If you could push a broom or if, if you could if swing a hammer mm -hmm. or you could swing a paintbrush, I would get them. I would get them, pull them off the streets. You better believe it. And we put them to work. Absolutely. It made it work for us. You know what I mean? And we also rent about $150, $200 cheaper, rent sky high in California. The cost of living is outrageous. And we rent cheaper than everybody because that keeps renters happy. 
Mm -hmm. And then it's the most affordable place around. So they're not moving very much. Mm -hmm. They take care of the place and you get lifelong friends out of it, you know, and it's a communication. It's community building skills. Okay. It's this ain't always about greed and and trying to stick it to the, to the next neighbor or friend or family, just because they're renting your home. That's not how it goes over here. We work together on things and we build things, slow growth over time. We make it together like that. And that's why our tenants stick around. So I got about over a hundred or so of those going on. So wow. really did really wow. good. Dos Palace Fireball, some out in the country. So I did really well with the with the with the spreader trucks and with their rentals. And um, since nine eleven came along, okay, I was hauling a load of grapes down to down to a cannery. Mm-hmm. And that's when it hit and man, it was a terrible day. And that's what sparked my interest. You know, like my God, how something so terrible could happen to our country. And that's sparked my interest. I, well, how'd this happen? And then I started being nosy about it. So when I get off work, I go click on the news, mm-hmm. click on the news. Mm-hmm. And then once I learned about that, I said, all right, well, well, what about the other areas you have interest in? Education, you know, what's Congress else? What else do they do besides go and pick on people and get blow, blow us up, you know? So I started learning about the different parts. Right. So for the right. last, over the last 20 years, I dedicated my life outside of work and made it my point for my family, my friends, because I love my country mm-hmm. and I don't like what's happening to it. Mm-hmm. So I made it my, my, it was basically my hobby. Okay. I, I raced motorcycle every once in a while. There's a racetrack down the road. We went to, you know, I did that play cards with the guy, have a beer on the weekends with the fellas. But, but other than that, I stayed focused. Okay. And I focused on their problems. I followed Congress. I followed the leaders basically for over 20 years mm-hmm. and I see and watch it and they do I watch their policies and, and when their policies don't work, what happens? And when their policies do work, what happens? So I've been paying attention. I'm a good listener. Okay. And I like to, I like to get involved. I don't mind getting my hands dirty. I don't mind spending all this time and effort to help people. Cause I always like to help people, you know, it's like my wife asked me, you know, well, why are you trying to do this for everybody else? I said, I'm not really changing. You know, I've been doing this for us and our family and our community already. I'm just doing it on a larger scale, on a scale bigger than it's hard to imagine. But right. I'm basically yeah. doing the same thing. It's just a lot wider and bigger message. I think this is super powerful. Like the things that that you are are saying, you know, and I want to take a moment to just highlight a couple of these things that I'm receiving from you because I want to make sure that you know listeners um who learn things in multiple different types of ways actually caught some of the hidden gems inside of what you said you spoke about hard work you spoke about perseverance you talk about you you spoke about being a self-starter like the things that you didn't know you jumped in and you learned it um and and you carried all of the knowledge you had from one thing over into another thing and then you've continued to kind of build upon that knowledge and, and your understanding of leadership um, from all aspects, right? From all of the different ways that you've had the information available to you. You've watched it, you've read it, you've listened to it, um, and, and you made the decision that now is the time to, to step forward and throw your, your hat in the ring, throw your name in the ring, um, in order to help represent a lot like millions and millions of other people yes. that are just like you which That's i think right. is so noble so so i have i have like two questions in one uh the first piece of this is it it has to be unbearably time consuming to run for president and to get your word out and to you know make sure people become more aware of your message and your passion and your heart so the first thing I'm going to say is to tap on something you said about your wife, right? You've been helping and working in the community and doing this already for, for a long time in, in so many different aspects. This is just at a larger scale. So how is your family readjusting to the amount of, I mean, I don't know if it's pressurized yet. Like, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't understand the whole process of running for president but yeah. um like how are they readjusting to this particular choice that you've made because it's not just you, uh, it's all it's all of you yeah it's my wife you know she's she's a medical transport she, she takes care of a lot of medical patients she, she she works she drives all the time and she comes home sometimes i'm doing a live interview and 
She might get a little bit, I can't even work all day, come home, you know, and you know, I said, well, you know, I'm trying to do something too. So it has its moments, you know, she, but, yeah. but she's with me wholeheartedly. She's not really into politics, but, but she supports her husband no. and she supports what I do. Yes. It has strained relationships because we got kids and they got some financial issues. So, you know, and, and then she helps me. She, she, she gives me some of her wages and then I got, you know, we got RO. So we kind of, it goes back and forth. But she's there, but but it has, it has put you know I will not lie, it has strained, you know it has its straining moments. There's no question about it, Absolutely. especially maybe more of me than than her, you know because I want to get this right because it's so important, mm -hmm. you know it's very important. I'm passionate about doing this, you know it's my true feelings of how I feel this should go, you know, and um, it's been tough, but. It, it does work out because she she knows deep down inside her heart that I'm truly trying to help other people and then you know and she, and she understands that and because she she's a people person too she likes doing you know taking the older lady back and forth to her medical appointments and stuff so she has it in her too it's just yeah. in a she knows that you know these people are good honest people and they need help and they need a ride but and these people up in Washington she don't care for none of those people. <laughs> so, you know what right. I mean? She just said, you better not end up like them. I'll take you down the road and put you in a ditch. <laughs> don't you ever change on me. You better right. stay like you are. That's the worst, you know. And I said, honey, I'm not going to change it. I know I'm almost 60 years old and that ain't going to change me. They'll try their influence. If they get up there and the American people pick me, I'm going to do what I promised American people to do. Yeah. I'm sure corporates are going to influence me and they're going to try to get me to swing their way. But you know what? I'm already set in my ways and it is what it is. They don't like it. That's too bad, you know, but That's it really goes to Congress. And, you know, I'm going to try to work with those people, but I'm dang sure ain't going to let them push me around or let them influence me with their money because I got my own money. I made my own way. I don't need their money. Okay. This is about something else. See, this, anyway. is, this is what I really like. And from the moment I, I became aware of you and started watching things about you online and, and checking out other interviews, uh, another quote that, that my father used to say to me um, is that nothing penetrates purpose. And you, are, you strike me as a man who is purpose-driven. And when you um, ignite your purpose, when you walk in that walk of faith, when you walk in uh, the light of what you believe you're here to do, uh, it becomes very difficult for people to control you. And it bothers other people because you are following your North Star, right? And so uh, I'll transition over and say, you know, in a lot of what you're saying, there's so much uh, underlying love for community and for bringing people together and for working uh, hand in hand and side by side other people and not taking advantage of them just because you have an opportunity to do it, which we have right. seen. That's not exclusive yes. to America. That's all right. over the place. But we definitely right. have seen that from corporations here in the mm -hmm. United States. So I would ask in terms of community, how like tell, can you talk to us about like you know any community level projects that you've been involved in whether they're local uh to to your town local to california or or local to the united states um right. what are what are some of the initiatives that you've been a part of and how did you bring in other constituents to help you reach that goal well involved a lot in the community service, you know, when people got in trouble and then they got signed in community service. So we made sure that, that we got, we got them bribed. We even actually used our own vehicles. Okay. Mm -hmm. To go and pick them up. Cause you know, if they didn't show up to their community, they get in trouble. And so we'd work with the people. They'd either have to go to the cemetery or in town at the city yards and do the work. And a lot of times they were kind of, a lot of people got in trouble. So everybody didn't have something to do. So I would bring them on. I would take responsible. I would tell the county and the rehabilitation, say, look, I'm a responsible businessman. I'm going to take these rehabilitation youth. I'm going to, I'm going to take the adults from the correction center. I'm going to assume full responsibility. They're going to be in my care. When you release them from your care, they're in my full custody. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure they're fed. They got a place to stay and they stay and work. And I worked hand in hand with the local law enforcement and they knew exactly when something happened, or if one of them tried to take off, 
We were always communicating with law enforcement. We communicate with the rehabilitation centers and also a lot of the parents when the kids ran away or even the parents, they lock, you know, they lock their kids up. But it's unfortunate they do that, but they just get mad at them or they get on drugs. They call the cops and there goes the poor kid and they get in those violent institutions and it just turns them, makes them worse. And I won't be, and I don't, I don't admit this. Some, some of them were my nieces and nephews. Okay. Mm -hmm. They went through these same problems because, you know, we have a little bit of money. So then, you know, they got a car and then next thing you know, and they got money, we give, mm -hmm. we give our kids money and then you know, they go uptown and then, you know, that's the kid with money. They start experiencing with alcohol and they start chewing tobacco. Okay. Right, right. So, so these, these problems affected our own families. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was important. Not only this community, Dos Palos, Fireball, and Los Banos area. So we put together these volunteer groups. Okay. That you know, when a parent was mad and the kid didn't want to do with it, or, you know, the cops did, you know, we were the go to people. Okay. We want, you know, it's the case. A lot of times, these small communities, the funds ain't around to have, you know, put a youth somewhere for the night or put, or put somebody else. So we'd have what our rentals set up in the different towns to where if you were either homeless or you was leaving the, or, just left the rehab center or, or your runaway and you and your parents were so mad they don't want you home we put them in a place so they were safe and off the streets mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of little boys and girls mm -hmm. you know what i mean 14 15 lost and confused mm -hmm. and so we put an elderly woman in there you know because i didn't want no man in there taking care of young female because then people talk and then Absolutely. if something happens so we put a Absolutely. female we put a, a female retired she was a retired correction officer so we put her in there and let the females go with the females. And then we had another house and we separated. We didn't put the guys in there because then you just get, they start our, we did it first when we first started this, but then you learn about, okay, I'm helping people, but but sometimes you can't put a young female and a young male together because then they start fighting the boyfriend, girlfriend thing. And then you know, the house falls apart. And then right. even the female cracks out, we can't help. So we got the boys out of there. We got them down on the other side of the block, you know, even though they, they met somewhere in the street, but. You know, that was that. At least they didn't bring it home. And, That's right. And the temporary places <laughs> we provided. So right. we did that and basically trying to influence other people to get initiative to start that and always have that around. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Always have those those places around for somebody because of, because the real estate's so expensive. OK, and it's hard to house a homeless person. It's hard to house a child or something. So yeah. basically we, we unified a system. To where okay we take these people with multiple people with multiple problems and try to bug them up here and see what we can do with them instead of just doing nothing at all in other words you know it's hard to house a couple of adults you know in one home and then a couple in another because it's just too expensive so you know you take you basically a five six bedroom home and you set it up for you can get seven eight ten of them in there and that way you know you get them off the streets you're taking care of them they got a place to eat and they got a place to work Mm -hmm. So basically, that's what we did. We took care of the people around us, and we provided these temporary shelters until they improved their lives. And, and by sticking around them, <clears throat> being there for them, mm -hmm. we got a lot of them off drugs. Not all of them. We couldn't save them all, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we had about a 50, 60 percent survival rate. And you know what? If you can save one child or one adult, that's hey, right. you did something. So that's powerful. there it is there. Yeah, that's powerful. I mean, you, there are always one thing of that. I, I'm in community service as well, and I do a lot of work in New York City and specifically in the Bronx, New York, and, and all of it is geared more towards adults. Um, and and I, I've always felt that, you know, we live in, in a day and time where after a certain age, we kind of throw people away. And, and we say, oh, well, they've had their chance. You know, children are the future. Let's push all our money in this direction. And I have no problems or qualms, you know, protecting our children and doing everything that we're supposed to be doing to make sure that they have a fair chance um, for, to be whatever they want to be, right? And, and right. to express themselves in whatever way feels most natural to them as a human being. Um, and, and so I think as a servant, I would say, you know, there's always going to be more need than what we have time on earth to solve, right? Oh, absolutely. That's the thing. Absolutely. Right. And so, but it's important. Right. <clears throat> no, sir. Go ahead. No, I don't want to interrupt. It's, yeah. It's important to have to, you know, since we got technology, it's important to do this. 
because the more you can do ourselves, because you can't sit around and wait for the government, you know, it's the more we can do as a community on a community level. That's right. Especially when you work together, you know, that's the main thing. You could actually do things cheaper, still going to cost you, but it won't, doesn't have to cost you as much and it doesn't have to be as hard. That's right. You know, between the law enforcement or the real bad citizens or the parents or the people on the street or the local landlords yeah. or just whoever, or sometimes city council members, some of them will work with you. Some of them won't, right. you know, cause everybody is so busy. Right. But that's the thing. That's, that's where the most could get, could get done. You know? That's right. That's right. I mean, I used to work for uh, the New York City public school system on the administrative side. And, um, you know, the most successful principals were people who were not afraid uh, to bring in all of the resources from the community that were available and kind of connect the dots so that there was a continual flow of support and knowledge and most importantly, love. Right. We right. forget that there has right. to be love in our there service to, to other people. We yep. love our country, but we also that also right. means we have to love each other. Right. Yeah. Even if we disagree with one another or right. at least care, you or know, at least love care. to like them, whatever. But, you know, but it is you got the right word. You got to love your ambition and, you, you know, you care about the human being itself. That's regardless right. of color or creed. It didn't matter. That's you know exactly what I mean? Right. That's exactly right. So, so I would love to transition over, like, to some of the hot topics. All right. Okay. Um, and, and and the first place I'd like to land is the LGBTQ plus community. Right. Um, what are you? What are some of your views? Right. Because I I've, I saw a couple of um, statements on your website. I, I saw some video on your website, and I I definitely agreed with uh, some of the things that you were saying. So I would love for you to give our listeners a chance to understand your views on on a couple of different topics. So within yep. the LGBTQ plus community, um, what is your stance on gay marriage? Hey, I'm all for it. And it's a shame that other states, as you can see it in my policy, it points out the amount of states that aren't for it. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that's bad news for the, for them because anytime a state doesn't recognize you as a human being and for who you are and your rights, regardless of your color or how you're different, gay or not, that if the state don't recognize your rights and who you are and respect you, how do you expect the people in that state to respect you? And that spreads hate and that spreads ignorance and that spreads things and danger to them, mm -hmm. not only for their marriage, but a lot of landlords, not in California. California has got the most aggressive laws to protect the LGBT and I'm proud to be from that state. Okay. And it's a dirty shame. A lot of these states aren't mm -hmm. along with some insurance companies, landlords. There's a whole mess of things out there. That's you right. see what I mean? That's and, right. and like I said, I'm for the marriage. Okay. But the worst part about all of this, let's not be mistaken here is the hate crimes. Yes. The hate crimes is, you know, marriage is one thing. We've got that covered. Like I said, in California, the other States, eventually, hopefully they'll come around. All right. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Sooner. And they can still be together right now, whether legally married, or not. So that really they're from a, from a health point of view, they're okay. Right. It's the it's the endangerment which disturbs me the most. It's the hate crimes where they continue to lose their lives mm -hmm. because of the ignorance in the states, because of the policies aren't there to protect them and to accept them for who they are. Right. We have to stop those hate crimes. And but but like I said, the people within those states are not going to respect those people until the state starts to respect those people. And then and then. And then only then you'll see a difference when the state starts to recognize them and change the laws in their favor, the people will follow along. Mm -hmm. So I blame all the governors of those states and those legislators. Shame on you. Shame on you. You are directly linked to those hate crimes, whether you like it or not. And it's time you change your ways because a large percentage of our youth today are LGBTQ. It's time their voices were heard. It's time the laws and regulations were put into place to protect them. And once that is done, those hate crimes will start to go away. They're just scared. The regular people are just scared of something new. That's what it is. It's the newness. It's okay to be gay. And I'm a firsthand person of it because I used to, when I worked on cars, 
I had all kinds of nobody back then, gay people, nobody wanted to fix their cars, believe it or not. Well, guess what? Wow. Larry fixed their cars. I had all kinds of gay people, believe it or not, coming out fixing my car and my straight friends. Well, what are you doing? Why are you fixing? Hey, their money is just as green as yours. And That's you know right. what? These people are more full of love and care than a straight person. Did you know that? That a gay person is 10 times more likely to be more loving and more caring than a straight person ever was. And also a minority person, you know, as long as they're not on drugs or strung out they they are more loving and more caring mm -hmm. than the average straight person believe that. So I work with them and the, the community loved it. And after a while they would see it when our friends never said nothing and they even become friends with some of them because they were just scared of the new things. So I actually mm -hmm. brung some of them together and they actually made friends, believe it or not. Yep. That's beautiful. Yep. That's beautiful. And yep. that is, that's absolutely uh, true where you're saying that, you know, when something is unfamiliar to someone, Right. And, and again, this is worldwide, right? We mm -hmm. we shy away from it. And unfortunately, when it comes to uh, different um, underserved groups, whether it's LGBTQ plus, whether it's minorities, uh, you know, other members of the BIPOC, uh, black and, and indigenous people of color, the BIPOC community, um, oh. it seems that hate and rejection are are the status quo and the easiest thing to reach for. And, and we right. reject people to the point of emotional and psychological trauma sometimes. And so I like the fact that uh, there's a potential that we could have a, a candidate in the White House, a president in the White House, who is looking out for, for everybody and not just the special interest groups. And, right. and so my question to you then would be, you know, being the president, Right. Um, it, it seems like there would be a million conflicting priorities simultaneously. So to help people kind of understand um, your your plan of action, what are, uh, you know, like the top three agenda items that you feel, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of things that are important. We're human beings. There are a lot of things that are important to us. I can't say one thing is sometimes necessarily more important than the other, but what are three things, three agenda items that you could tell the people about that would be your focus, um, at least in that first 100 days, but throughout your, your uh, time as president? Economy, climate, and national security. And let me start at the beginning. Our economy, it's important. We invest more in America to provide better paying jobs for our American citizens and immigrants that come to our country to provide more opportunities to put down roots. Okay, the economy is actually, we are an economy of consumption and dysfunction. I want to go to economy of construction and production because without a good economy and a good solid base to build our products and services here, you don't have the jobs and services or products available for the next generation of people, mm -hmm. including our own generations. That's why a lot of people are left out of work. You, it, they always lie about the numbers out there. Okay. People, and then they've got that welfare wheel down to so far of nothing because you know, they don't want people on it and you can't even pay rent on welfare. And if there was a decent job around people or good people, most people want to work. Okay. Mm -hmm. If that job was there, they could, they tell that people, you know what, take your welfare and cram it in your, you know what, because we don't want it and we don't need you. Right. We need a good paying job. We need to boost our rural communities. We need to build up our places. And that only happens if you build corporations and start building products and services. Okay. That's enough on the economy. Let's move to the climate. Mm -hmm. Okay, because first you need a good job. You need a place to live. That's that's, right. that's important. Okay, like you said, there's lots of other problems, but let's think about the three most important. You need a good job, you need a place to stay. That's covered. Now, the climate. If we don't start taking care of our earth, well, guess what? Worse, mental health, your mental health, your asthma and health-related diseases skyrocket. Mm -hmm. Plus our earth, our ozone layer, that's bad news bad news. So it's very important to take care of our climate. 
a renewable energy package. It's not going fast enough. They're spending trillions and trillions of dollars, and most of it's leaving our country. They're not spending it in the infrastructure here. Most of it goes out like we're buying solar panels in China and everywhere else. We should be making them right here, make the plants here, put our own solar panels in, okay? And the same with those electrical car batteries, okay? Because they're being most, China has cornered the market, 75% of them batteries. We need to start making our own batteries here, okay? Because that's our transportation grid. You don't want to depend on another country for your transportation because this has to do with climate. Because the sooner we build these products, the better it is for our climate. That's less and less gas vehicles, less and less diesel. Get the electric trucks out there, the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our climate package. And I have a climate policy and it explains all this. But you can't depend on another country to to rebuild your energy to to build your energy to your to rebuild your energy to rebuild to build up your renewable energy package you can't depend on another foreign country we need to do it because you're paying their prices you're buying their solar panels and their quality control is almost nothing they don't last they make very little electricity the american solar panel has made a lot better plus you're putting american people to work or our immigrants you're providing more jobs and products here. And then if we make enough for ourselves, then we'll be able to trade with other countries. You know, they, China can buy our solar panels for a while. And even if it costs a little bit more, it wouldn't matter. You're putting more people to work. But I don't think it's going to cost any more. They use that as an excuse. The time they make it over there, and they're paying the people, and they put it on that boat, and they ship it over here, and they move it in all them trucks. That's just a big lie. It's a big corruption act. It's time to build them here because it's important. So the faster we build our energy, and then we need them transportation stations. They suck up a lot of energy, you know, where you charge them up on the road, especially if you go to the trucks. There's a lot of diesel because of the climate. So we need to start getting those electric charging stations in place. Mm -hmm. They burn a lot of electricity as much as a small town. So we need to think about some type of cleaner solution, maybe like natural gas, because it burns super clean you know, to run a power plant or even a nuclear power plant, a miniature one, a miniature nuclear power plant to run these because we don't have the energy available because, you know, because you town years to continue, towns continue to grow and stuff, right? Right, right. So you have, you need electricity for that and dairies out here and stuff. So these electrical energy stations that they're going to put out, they need to probably consider many nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. You know, you, then if they don't want to do that, then they can use natural gas. It's pretty clean. Because that that is one of the cleanest fuels out there, so and you know we, we and we need to transition away from the diesel, the diesel fuel, not the clean highway fuel, but the red number two diesel. Okay, they use it in the agriculture so throughout California. It's red and it's dirty. Mm -hmm. They need to get rid of that, and they make the highway trucks use the clean fuel, just like our business. We have to use the the white stuff, the clear stuff on the highway, and but we can use the red stuff in the field. Well, that's ignorant. We need to use because there's more field action. There's just as much field action as there is highway action because it's, it's a large California, large agriculture, one of the largest around. Right. So you imagine all that dirty red fuel and all them tractors. And not only here, every state across our nation, around the world. So these big oil companies need to lean in. Okay, they got the filters. They need to start refining this fuel. And, and these changes alone is going to help preserve our climate. This is very important to our health and to our future way of life. And we can work with big oil. It's a mistake when a Democrat leans too far to the renewable energy factory, especially leaning out to other nations that fix it. And they also, oh, they shut down drill and this and that. That's a big mistake because then they shut down oil and gas and they have, and they're not really making adjustments to their policies. Mm -hmm. See, they lost an opportunity, in other words, to work with big oil and gas on a cleaner fuel solution to shut them down. See, that's right. a big mistake Democrats are making. They always make it, oh, well, we're not drilling anymore. We're going to go we're gonna green. We, they can't go green fast enough, and you can't just wean off gas and oil overnight. So that's another. That's where Republican Democrats, that's why they're going to want to work together, because I'm willing to work with big oil, see, mm -hmm. on the cleaner fuel service. Get rid of that red junk. We don't need that no more. They're big and rich enough. We put in the filters. Get that clear diesel in them tractors. They'll burn it. They're set up to burn it. And give it to the farmers for the same price because the highway diesel is cleaner, so they charge more. Mm -hmm. So we'll give it to them for the same price as the red diesel and get that cleaned up. All right, that's enough about our climate. All right, national security. Okay, so now we got, we got our economy going on. We got our climate trying to get it straightened out and cleaned up. Mm -hmm. All right, 
So we need national security. Without without that, the first two ain't gonna do a good world, ain't gonna do you no good or a good job ain't doing this unless you got security. That's, that's right. bad news, especially our borders, okay? Because that's where the next 9-11 is gonna come from, unfortunately, okay? The terrorists know this, that's bad news, okay? And I'll tell you why, because the average border because of the flow of traffic day in and day out, they see thousands of trucks and thousands of cars. Their border guard, even they, they got x-ray machine, they got state-of-the-art technology. Don't get me wrong. They got stuff that they can see upside, you know, so they can see the Nats, Nats butt of whatever you <laughs> might be carrying, whether it's in your guts, you know, like airlines or whether it's in the truck, they can see it. But that's only as good as you can get in there. But they can't check all those trucks. I'm not worried about the cars. You know, they scan them. It's the trucks. That's the large transport. That's where all the dangers coming from. You know, mm -hmm. one fit, one pill, one kill. So, what we need to do, because they could only check, probably what? Say what? How many you think big trucks? Fifty, a hundred trucks, maybe a day, maybe at a border, maybe, and versus a thousand. Okay, you. We all got backup cameras in our cars nowadays. Okay, mm -hmm. how come we don't stick one little ten dollar backup camera on the back of that trailer up there? All right, that way they can watch the forklift drivers loading it and unloading it, okay? Because they actually hide it in to hide it in the fake floors, mm -hmm. okay? That'll make the, tr the truckers more honest and the more companies honest because they're loading people, all illegal immigrants. They'll fill up a trailer full of semis, hundreds of trailers, and here come them immigrants. Here come them drugs, okay? And it's nonstop. So these wow. cameras are going to make them more honest, and we could turn that camera on military, Borders guard, local law enforcement, we could turn that camera on and when the trucker's at home, wherever that trailer's at, on the dock, doesn't matter. And nobody better tamper with it. That way, that's going to clean them up. That's going to make everybody more honest. And that's going to help stop the next 9-11. Otherwise, they're liable to drop our Golden Gate in the Pacific soon because terrorists are on the rise. Okay, you just see the government goes over there and seizes billions and billions of dollars through the bank accounts. And that pisses people off. And then they take over people's oil fields. So they're always looking to terrorize us. And, and it's it going to stop reduce a lot of the drugs and this simple technology. Mm -hmm. I put it out there. It's in my immigration. It's in my national security policy. And then also not into our nation, but they need to use the same method around the globe. They're not using this technology. This technology is available and it's ready to use. And why? And then they're using that standstill, you know, where you got to go, they're only checking 50 inch trucks, 100 trucks. Now we can check any truck. So they, so the truckers won't know. We can tune in anytime, in any truck, anywhere in the nation or around the world at any border. This is the way forward for border protection. And, and this is a national security thing. That's powerful. So it's very important. We take this technology available and use this because that will help secure our borders. You better believe it because it's the, where the bulk's coming in. That's the biggest threat mm -hmm. to our security is the guns, drugs, or for the next bet, you know, next load of fertilizer bombs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of time before it happens. And it's a shame if something like that happens. Oh, then they'll say, oh, well, well, we should have did what he said. Okay. Because right. don't think they're not planning. Don't think they're not watching. Don't think they're not listening. Because they're looking, for, our, they're looking for weak spots. They're looking for weak spots and they can see them. The drugs are pouring in right now. And what you can see it in the Washington. McCarthy go down there, Mercado there to order the, to the Texas governor. And then Biden goes down there with his big cool shades on this on so, Hey, what are they doing? They're doing an interview, laughing, making jokes, fighting one another, not doing anything about it. Nothing. They haven't done anything to protect our borders. And they're not going to because they don't care. They're hand in hand with the cartel or they just turn a blind eye to it and let them get away with it. It's one of the two, or maybe all of them, right? Mm, that's so. powerful. That's powerful. I mean, I think you are you are one hundred percent correct that that terrorism never sleeps, and no. America has uh, a lot of friends, and America has a lot of enemies, as do many of the countries around the world, right? So anyone who is interested in espionage and and you know taking down another government, uh, setting up false regimes, this type of thing. They're always thinking in that same zone, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to be prepared and we have to be looking for new ways to protect our citizens. Um, and so those who do the protect protecting, right, are, are uh, men and women in the military. They're the ones that are out here 
charged with and who have taken up the call of service to protect our freedoms and pr protect us as we, we move about in our different cities to help protect us uh, in foreign lands. Um, but however, you know, Time Magazine did an article recently saying that there are 17, I'm sorry, that, uh, with the veterans, I apologize, uh, is that there was a recent research survey done by Pew Research Center um, and they had some interesting results, right? And so here are a couple of key takeaways. Um, more veterans say the military did a good job preparing them for life in the service than it did for readying them for the transition back to civilian life. How will you, as president, help prepare our military personnel, not only for their roles uh, in the armed forces, but to also support them uh, as they transition back to civilian life. We have so many homeless veterans. I see them all around New York City. Uh, we have so many folks that, that have food insecurity, uh, that are honest working, honest people who want a job but can't find one because for some reason uh, employers are not employing them. How, how would you fix that situation for our nation's veterans? Well, we're gonna put, it, put together a plan Let's start on the, at the beginning, and then we'll work our way on the transition phase. Okay, mm -hmm. for the ones going in, okay, it's very important when they go in to fight for our country, okay, and protect us, okay, and it's a shame that while they're in there serving, that they got to worry about their wife and kids at home because they don't have the benefit packages, okay, and they're worried because the military in Washington won't give it to them, okay, so... A lot of them drop out, especially the moms, because of sexual harassment, mm -hmm. because of family benefit packaging, because they won't take care of their kids. And that's a dirty shame. A person's going to risk their life to protect us, and we won't even protect them, what protect their family at home or their children's. Right. And you won't even protect their own female officers while they're actually got their life on the line. Right. This is a big problem. Google it and find out. That's the number one reason females quit. I'm gonna put a no-nonsense policy into place. I catch any guy doing that. You're not getting no warnings. You're not getting no slap on the hand. There ain't gonna be no joke. You're gone. That's it. You're gone. They're not throwing them out. They're letting them, oh, well, they move them or they write them a suspension. Oh, and they don't do that, don't do that. Nuh uh you're gone. No tolerance. We have no tolerance for that. You think when that female officer <clears throat> goes home, Okay, after she quits because she was molested, raped, and sodomized and all that, you think she's going to go home and tell her daughter, hey, daughter, I had a wonderful experience in the military. Why don't you go sign up? Right. No, no, she's not. She's going to stay, stay out of there. That place is miserable and no good. That's why their numbers are down all across the branches. And that's a threat to our national security, let me tell you. Now, once that's fixed, that female... The warrior is going to go home and say, daughter, I was protected. I was respected. I did my job. I served my country. And you know what? It's a whole new military out there. Those branches are finally got their acts cleaned up. Mom, I'd be glad to join. Where do I sign? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what needs to be done. That's and they need to work on their benefits package, their benefits. Because you see, and also we need to extend their leaves a little bit. They're complaining of that. Their leave's not long enough, okay? Because mm -hmm. sometimes they, they only get leave once a year. Maybe thinking about give them, maybe give them, you know, give them a little bit of week every six months or give them a little bit longer leave at the end of the year. We want to break up so they can go see their family. But if you read the top five reasons, and this is to all the branches, not just any one particular, there's some of the main concerns. So we want to fix that. That way they're more comfortable serving, okay? Mm -hmm. And then they don't have to worry about at home or what's going to happen to them, the hazing, the sexual stuff. And once that's eliminated, they're going to be more comfortable doing their job and serving their country. Okay. So now a lot of them, when they, when they get sign in bonuses, okay, mm -hmm. to go in, that's all fine and dandy. But once you're in, you get in a regular salary anyway. Okay. Right. So you're getting fed, you got a place to stay, you're in boot camp or whatever. So, so, so you're being taken care of. So we need to look at, and so they get that money and they, they send it home or they put in words or they blow it. I don't know what happens to it, you know, at first. So, so maybe 
think about on the other end because as an average uh, veteran to get out in a one or two year gap some of them have trouble finding work six months a year to average two years mm -hmm. so maybe give them something on there so i'm going to put together a military personnel transition package specially tailored for this yes and we're going to maybe put it on the other end because they're already being taken care of once they sign up and go in hey it's good so let's shift that over to the back end so when they come out they have that because they may want to wait six months. They want you want to clear their head. You know, they just might have seen a bunch of killing, blood and guts. You know, they got they got to clear their head. They want to see their family, maybe make a few babies or whatever, you know, be, become civilian again. OK, and this gives them time. They don't have to rush off and, you know, be a security guard or, or rush off and, and take a job that they're not going to be happy with. This is going to give them time to resettle back with their families. Mm -hmm. This is going to give them time to go and actually pick the job they want instead of being forced to take a job that's there that's because right. they are under pressure to go out and get that rent. And then that puts a lot of them under pressure mentally drives them more to alcohol, more abuse. So a lot of these things are tied to the, to the human spirit and the emotions and how things are set up. The government affects us and their policies more than, you know, emotionally, mm -hmm. psychologically. So I really studied this because it bothers me. It truly bothers me. So that's why I designed this. You got to look at these problems from all angles mm -hmm. and how we can move this money and make these solutions to where it's tailored to them. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, that is the way forward that in that direction, we might have to change a little bit here or here, but also we want to keep in mind that when that happens, especially like say in New York or whatever area where you see a lot of homeless or veterans out there, we want to put some more organizations together. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do better in the private sector. Okay. As far as it's like, it's like we try to house one person around here. It's too real estate. It's cost too much. You can't house one person anymore. That's off the table. And a lot of people try to tackle homelessness one person at a time. You cannot do that. Those days are gone. It's the same with a homeless veteran. You can't do that. You got to think numbers. You got to think bolt 10, 15, 20 people. And you turn this over to the private sector. Okay, so where we can set these private institutions up where, okay, we're going to incentivize these private individuals. They're going to put their own money up, but we're going to help them with their electric. You know, we're going to give them, we're going to give them cut on electric. We're going to cut them on the permits and fees and taxes. Okay, that makes it good for the landlord. Okay, and then we'll be able to house more veterans in one complex for a lot cheaper price than the average price now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it can't do it with the government because they, they don't they don't do it right. We're going to turn over the private individuals to the small business veterans community. OK, it's going to be veteran owned businesses. OK, veterans that that could get, be applied, they can apply for the loan. Yes. They are going to be specifically designed for veteran small business person to go in there, apply for the loan and say, all right, you're going to take care of 20 veterans. This is this is what, your baby. We're going to give you these tax breaks. We're going to help you with your pg e program because they help PB, you know, pg e help you when you're on the care package. You get cheaper electric because they're veterans. They earned it. That's right. Okay. And then since it's veterans owned, you're going to be able a veteran rental price where they come in, they pay 100, 200, 300, whatever it is, you know, per room, make their small little rooms. That way, that person makes a little bit of money, you know, and it's a veteran. So he's not going to be greedy, kind of like we rent cheaper than everybody else around here. So that's how they got to do it. You got to take the greed mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. and, and and I think because who knows better than the veterans, right? That's right. The veterans know you had to have been there. You had to have served. And you know what it's like to be homeless. So you don't just want anybody running these private, it's, these private areas where to help get some of them off the streets mm -hmm. and back into a home or a temporary place to stay. I love that. My father uh, was a, a army veteran from from the Vietnam War, and, and one of his messages that that stuck with me from throughout time and even to this day, uh, even though he's gone now, is, is he used to always say, "Tim, I want to make sure that no matter what you do, you look out for our nation's veterans." And and it, it, you know, as a younger kid, you don't necessarily understand you know the weight and the impact of that kind of situation, because I don't think everyone has a full understanding of how much our veterans go through when they are off in battle or or when they are assigned to these like really high risk 
kind of situations. And one of the things that, that you, you mentioned that, that I really received well was, you know, for some reason, and, and I never thought about it like this until this conversation, for some reason, it seems that we don't, um, we don't allow our, our minds to think about our, our military personnel in the same way that we think about any other job that anybody has. Eventually you get stressed out and you need a vacation and you need to know that, you know, there's a, a good health plan and you need to know that there's job security while you're on vacation or while you're on maternity leave or all of these other things. And I don't know why more people haven't connected those dots for our military veterans as well. But I really appreciate your response to that. Um, I want to pick up on one thing that you said in terms of, you know, the, the specialized programs and making sure uh, that they're assigned off to the right corporations, right? And that we're, um, one of my previous man, uh, supervisors used to say, you have to inspect what you expect, right? And so um, as we think about tax breaks, there are good tax breaks, right? Because I think that phrase gets lumped into something negative no matter, you know, what the right. conversation. So there Absolutely. are good tax breaks if you're doing something right by humanity and by our, our fellow citizens. And then there are the other types of tax breaks that people get because of of a certain level of privilege, right, of wealth, of yep. um, the family has decades long uh, dealings with elected officials, et cetera. So what are your thoughts on tax breaks for the rich and for major companies, right? Like what types yep. of policies um, specifically do you plan to introduce to bring, you know, more fairness to the working middle class? Right, well, first and foremost, corporate needs to start paying their fair share, okay? The ones that build more here, and hire more Americans here are going to get a better tax break. Let's be clear on that. Okay. Cause that's helping out. The majority of them are not, they're taking their money and they're going overseas and building elsewhere. Those need to pay more. Let's just be fair about it straight across the band. Let's be open and honest. Okay. Mm -hmm. If they want to work here, that's fine. You're going to get, you're going to get tax breaks. Probably won't pay much at all, but the ones that keep leaving, they're the ones that can need to be hammered. They're the ones that need to start paying their fair share because the majority of the American workers tax money, we're footing everything. We're paying for everything because they're not. They're not paying hardly anything at all. So basically, we're, our country is running on America's hard working tax money. OK, so you can't fix everything and you see what they're spending. They're spending more than our taxes we're, than we're making. And you can't make everything. We can't fix everything we need on just our tax dollars, on the American workers' tax dollars. We mm -hmm. need that extra corporation tax money to put the infrastructure together because mm -hmm. our taxes alone cannot do it. That's another big problem, okay? So that's I think that's fair straight across the world. They want to help out and they want to build here, fine. And also, you know, you don't have to give the person a million dollars an hour. You know, you give them a decent wage as long as it's good working conditions, you know, this. Fifty, sixty dollar an hour. We can't do that, you know. Give them twenty five, thirty dollar, you know, a little weight, something reasonable. Don't you know? None of this outrageous. So the people have to meet them in the middle too, you know, a reasonable wage to to, to make their rent or their mortgage payment. So it's going to talk, take people working together, you know, on all sides on that. But there is a way forward, and it's called working together, That's you know. Right. And 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 like to take some of that corporate welfare money. Well, they call it corporate welfare because I mean, they give them incentives, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to turn a lot of that over to the small business community. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because that creates competition, okay? So we need competition. And a lot of them corporations are big enough. They don't need all the incentive packages. They're already big enough, especially if they're not going to pay their fair share of taxes. So we'll put these, okay, if you don't pay your fair share and you keep going over there, well, then we're going to take these incentives. We'll give them to the small business administration. So anybody wants to come in, start their own business, we'll give them the incentives. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because that creates a competition. So now they're making products and services. Well, right. that drives corporations to bring their prices down because now they're trying to compete with you. So this creates a competition and it creates some money incentives for us to go small business and go in there mm -hmm. and start, you know, basically building new corporations from the ground up And what I'm saying. Right. If these corporations, right. ones that are existing, don't want to come and play ball in America, well, we're going to create our own new corporations and we'll play ball with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause this is big league. 
You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We may have to get a bunch of small business, you know, a bunch of people together, get, you know, join in. You know what I mean? To go in there and, you know, put 20 of the people together, start a big corporation because it takes a lot of people with a lot of money, you know, and that's pull right. their money and pull their incentives that's and right. build these new corporations. I think that's another key aspect. And you put these new corporations together to provide competition against them. And then they'll start saying, okay, well, we better come over here and start working with him or he's going to put us out of business. Right. So, (laughs) so you know what I'm saying? That that is the way forward. And then like on the rich, the celebrities and the super elite, the billionaires, I figure a fair 3%, anything over $50 million a year, you know, I 3%, that's not bad. You know, that's fair enough. Pay 3% over 50. And then for every billion, Maybe another three percent on that for every billion that they make. You're in, you're out. Another three percent. That's easy. I'm not price gouging them. It's a fair little small increase. Mm-hmm. They need to pay that, and they're not really paying nothing right now. And and even a lot of legislators in Congress, they have proposed this idea and never got anywhere because they're corruption. But but you can see it. It's in the income equality. It's in my policy. I wrote it up. I put it out there exactly how I want to do it. It's all written down, and. Um, I believe that, and then also in some of the areas for the working class, you want to take that and, you know, bump their wage up a little bit, depending on the area. Each each area is different. Some areas, the economy is a little better. It depends on what state you live in. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You know, on on your wage adjustment. But to get them that living wage, whether it's a couple of dollars more an hour or maybe three or four, depending on where they're at, the rent. Mm -hmm. So to help them with their rent or help them with their mortgage. So. We may have to adjust a dollar to an hour here and there, depending on the area you live in. Right. So, right. So, you know, and and then I think one of the like kind of intrinsic problems that we face is that, uh, you know, corporations that are not paying their fair share have all the money in the world to then um, back specific candidates who uh, who align themselves with that particular kind of mantra of, of whatever particular corporation, right? And you never really see a bunch of these guys like out in, uh, in the front of television parading themselves around. It's always like this little hidden thing um, of where the money comes from. So I would say, uh, so I would ask, you know, are you currently backed by any corporations? And that doesn't mean, I don't mean that with a negative connotation, like if you have right. backing from someone that automatically that's right. something dark and, and sinister, that's right. definitely not true and not what I mean. Um, right. But are you currently backed by any any corporation or, or special interest group? And and if not, like, where do you personally feel like you draw the line? Like if somebody came and said, I've got, you know, a hundred million dollars for your campaign. However, you need to vote like this when the time comes. Like, where do you draw the line for yourself? Well, no, I have nobody. That can be right now. No corporations or special interest groups. Maybe because of my policies, or just they ain't there. They favor the popular government because that's they're happy with the way things are. But you know, as we spread the interest, everybody's not happy with them. But as we spread the word and keep the word out there, you know, and I'm sure that the people that would come along, they would be more to buy ideas because obviously they wouldn't be happy with the current leadership. You know, otherwise they would already be in there. Mm-hmm. So for them to come along, and get with me. They'll probably be more in, in my line of vision because they probably care and they have money because there is a lot of celebrities out there that do care. OK, and there is right. corporations, leaders that do care. OK, right. there are some. Don't get me wrong, but they're not just going to dump their money to any candidate. So absolutely, I would be open to somebody. I mean, that's probably what it's going to take, you know, to get me on the big news channels, you know, and then the marketing campaign so I can get my commercials out there. Right. That is the next step. That's why I'm doing this. Hopefully yeah. I can get enough attention to get somebody That's but right. no if they want me to do sue something bad you know what i mean then you know it's not going to work because i'm going to speak how i want to speak you see what That's i'm right. saying i'm the way i'm campaigning to you today and the way my policies are it's already written what i want to do so i really can't change or lie you see what i'm saying right because that's not me that's not who i am right it's just right. not so I, nothing's going to change nothing's going to change i'm going to stick to the game plan That's and right. remember if you do get in and remember this remember this I'm doing this because I care and I want to bring change. I've always done. I'm not just doing this because all of a sudden I care and all of a sudden I want to run that I've been like this my whole life. So, yeah, 
that first and foremost. The second thing is, remember, if you make it the first time, it's a chance you can be there for another four years. Okay, so there'd be another time. That, hey, you did a good enough job the first four years. Well, look, look at the opportunity you have for the next four. So if you mm -hmm. screw things up, you're gone. Right. See, or you got impeachment and then there's other things and then you get a bad name and then you ruin everything. You see right. what I'm saying? And, right. and not with my community, my friends, because this went out when this is over. I got to come back somewhere. I got to come back to the community. I got my friend, my family, my wife, and say, hey, what happened? What'd you do? No, I'm not like that. I'll give it to you straight. I'm a straight shooter. I'm a straight shooter. I got my own money. I don't need it. This is all about the people's movement. This is about be the people. That's right. That's, That's right. right. I, I love that. So, you know, that vibe right there, you know, I'm not changing. This is how I've been my whole life. This is this is who you are, right? Um, what do you feel because there are so many i know so many people like that and i think that's one of the most wonderful things about america is that yeah. you can you can it's it is the land of opportunity there are all of these uh levels to it right i think we have to admit mm -hmm. that those levels exist that people who come from privilege um automatically have more opportunities but anybody can grab themselves by the bootstraps as you explained when you were young how you built your way up through all of these jobs took on more leadership roles took up um you know more opportunity to bring more people together to reach a common That's goal right. so mm -hmm. as i think about uh and as we think about america as a community what are your views on uh, your thoughts on America's current standing like in the world, both with our allies and, you know, with our adversaries? W where do you feel like we are at, at this point in time? And what are some, and for the things that you might mention that that um, that are negative, where where do you feel like you're the best person to change the view of America or another country's experience? um with our behaviors and beliefs well first and foremost we got to stop being a bully with some of these countries we got to learn to be a better friend we got to learn to work better with them we got to reach out instead of shout out and shake fingers at them and point and accuse things and things that aren't true and go and do things that are immoral and wrong there's a lot of corruption does that they go and pick on smaller countries just because they're powerful enough it's because of the ignorance in washington we got to learn to work better with the foreign countries, okay? And not only that, you got to have the right leadership. You want to send people in there that, that speak the language, that understand that we share some of the same concerns that you do. We are no different. Just because you're a different color or you talk a different language, we share the same concerns, the same values, the same principles. We want to work together on this. We want to build bridges. We want to build opportunities that are going to last a long, long time. And right now, our government in Washington, for the last handful of administrations or so, hasn't been very good at that. Okay. Ever since the 2000s and on, you know, all the war, they haven't been very good at going out and working with other countries. Mm -hmm. We've been a bully. We're not very friendly. So we need to be a little bit more friendly. And also, I will extend my hand to any. Any terrorist countries out there, a lot of times, if you study terrorism, which I have, and you understand it, they're looking for opportunity too. That's either because they're hungry, they need food, they need medicine, they need to protect themselves. So they're vulnerable, okay? So if we're not helping them plant, give them tractors, put, put dams in, help them farm, help them put roads in, build them infrastructure so they can survive. Okay, they're going to turn to another terrorist in China or Russia. And that's what builds terrorism is people like Russia and China. Okay, and there's a couple other handful of countries that are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a big thing. My policies, I'm going to go after terrorists and talk to them. Look, what's your problem? You know, to get them to come to the table. I mean, it sounds crazy, but. Why are you doing this? But what I've never even need? heard anyone ask the question. I love it. I mean, just, what's going on? What do on? you need? No, yeah. what do you need? Stop this now, you human being. You got kids. I know you love your kids. I know you don't want to do, you would see a nine-year-old with AK in his hand. That's just terrible. That's terrible. We got to confront this. And the only way you do that is to go talk to them, you know, over the screen or wherever, or get the message to them. Hey, look, we're willing to work with you. 
Stop the madness. Let's put some infrastructure in. I know you want to feed and take care of your kid. I know you need medicine. I need you know you need babies, you need your hospitals. Let's do this. Let's start working together. That's my message to them right here, right now. I'm willing to work with those people. Because sometimes they're drove to terrorism. You might not be able to save them all like the kids on the street, but you know what? I saved a good percentage of them. So there it is there. So if you could stop one or two terrorists or a handful, then we've done our job at the end of the day and we've made our nation and our world a better and safer place. That's very powerful. Absolutely. That's very powerful. Um, so, you know, I want to go ahead and get into like our final couple of questions. I know that you're super busy. You've given me an immense amount of time and I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to be a part of this process. Uh, I represent the voice of, of many different uh, citizens uh, here in New York City and, and from my hometown back in the Midwest. I'm from Nebraska. Um, so so let's, uh, let's kind of transition into our final thoughts. Uh, you know, Time Magazine put out an article recently saying that there were 17 people running for the president of the United States. And they list it as 13 Republicans that also include uh, former President Donald Trump, uh, three Democrats, including our current uh, Mr. President, President Mr. Biden, uh, and a third party candidate. Now, that obviously is those are obviously only the, the top, top names of people who are already right. in different parts of government right. and already on TV everywhere and already doing all these things. They're not taking into account all of the other completely service and purpose driven people like you that are citizens right. who have who are right. out here trying to do the right thing not only for yourself and your family but for all of the rest of us right so Correct. how so other so i know that you're doing podcasts obviously like mine on the colors of sound you're you i've seen you do other um you know smaller venues you know just trying to get the word out and being very grassroots which I think is super powerful because when you do that, you're making a lot of real connections with people and, and you're presenting who you are in truth and in honesty. So that's right. With the, the, the candidate pool being so just like piled on, piled on, piled on with all of these different people, with all these different uh, agendas, how are you like walk us through, like what is your plan moving forward of how you're going to continue to get your message out, how you're going to also be able to keep um, people clear, right? Because I think one of, and, and this isn't specific only to you, it's to anybody. We always see folks that as you begin to gain more momentum, you have the special interest groups, you have this private you know, section of people, you have other candidates um, that start to put you under attack. Right. And they start to twist your words around and they start to mm -hmm. take what you say and try and use it against you in some way. How are you going to go about continuing to keep your your message out there and build your following and also keep your message pure uh, as, as you, you know, move into 2024? Well, just keep after it. I'm going to go after these large like CNN and some of these large new agencies. I'm going to write to them mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask to be interviewed. I've been a right my local tv news networks okay channel 34 is around here mm -hmm. up in the bay area and i'm going to keep coming to keep getting the word out there i'm going to start getting these large news days so i'm gonna start picking on them until they interview me. so <laughs> i'm going to use my resources to do what i can to get the message out there okay i'm not going to stop i'm going to keep doing what i'm doing but i'm just going to do more mm -hmm. get another news day see get a larger one just keep picking and keep telling them hey i'm here you know just keep spreading the message and keep knocking on doors and keep going after it you got to stay after it this is you know it's not over yet we got to stay after it and also trying to get into these universities a lot of these kids are skeptical you know that's going to help my momentum so i'm trying to get in fresno state trying to get into ucla it's a big college you know in la mm -hmm. so i'm writing them a lot of groups you know like the Democrat, they're with the popular government so they don't want nothing to do with me so i'm hammering away at those organizations hopefully i can get into some of these universities and, and get the kids behind me that's going to help a great deal i'm working on that right now i'm hammering away on them universities hope that's going to come through and as far as them other people as they build momentum and stuff and get get popular mm -hmm. they're going to start hammering at me you know go ahead you know that's all it is is a big distraction they're going to try to throw you off your game you know i'm prepared for this I, i'm the person who i am you know i might smart back but you know, I'm going to stay on message. I'm going to stay on point. I'm going to focus on the American people. 
look at it now. They're just they're bashing everybody day in day out. You get that a lot of that on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I did a, a, about three, four, five, about six months ago, probably. I was like that a little bit, you know, because you get more attention like that. But, right. you know, it makes you feel foolish. It makes you feel like a kid. And they're just a bunch of idiots doing that. It makes me feel childish and stupid. And I don't like doing that. You know, I might, you know, pop off and tell them one or two what to do. You know what I mean? Because I will right. stack up for myself and I That's will tell right. them like it is. That's right. But I'm going to stay on message. Okay. This is about all of us. This is about moving forward. You want to get too far a point and they're going to say what they want to say. If I said everything perfect, if I did everything perfect, they're going to come up with something anyway. They're going to manipulate the video to say, they go ahead. That's they're going to do it anyway. So it doesn't matter. I'm prepared for that. Let them have fun. They got nothing better to do. Pick on me. Hey, that may be that make me more popular, whatever. <laughs> That's but, right. That's right. I love but, silent movies because but I will, I will pick. Yeah. I, I, I will, yeah, yeah. Please go in, ahead. You know, I will put them. Back, I will put them in a check, but then I'll leave it there. I won't go off on. You know, I won't go off on them. But you know, I want to stay on point, stay the message because it's not what's made in America; it's what's missing in America. And right now, we're missing an administration with a legislative agenda that's focused on our values and interests. In other words, moving us forward as a nation and as people, not only here but around the world. That's why my campaign logo is MIA. I love it. There it is there. I love it, sir. Listen, I want to thank you for being with us today. You've you've done a phenomenal job being yourself and, and you know, expressing the truth behind why you're so passionate um, as a citizen, as a community builder, as a leader. Um, you know, the title of president is just that. It's a title that comes with the opportunity for, for you to create teachable moments for all of the rest of us on how we can work together and not hate each other, how we can have differences and still be okay and still be able to break bread with one another uh, and not burn the town down. Um, you know, I thank you for your patience, um, you know, in, in settling into this interview. The, the community may not know, but I had some technical issues and you were so gracious. And so I just want to end the recording. Thank you for, for being willing to come back and give me a minute to work out some things on my side. Um, that's very important to me to know that you care enough to let a little guy like me, you know, really try and get it right. So I thank you for that. Um, are there any final thoughts that you would like to share with the community at large? Um, you know, as you uh, begin to build momentum uh, uh, through the end of 2023 and coming into 2024, um, and, and I'm sure to a much wider and wider audience, are there any final thoughts? No, just, you know, spread the word and just let people know that there's other choices out there besides the ones in Washington, you know, and that, um, you know, it's important to vote. It's important to get involved. You want to make sure and get involved. It is important to vote. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Even because even, there's a lot of candidates out there, even if it ain't the more popular ones, vote for me or vote for the one of the less popular ones. Don't just go out there and not vote at all. It's important to get involved. It's very important to be involved in what takes place because your vote does matter. That's it right. all matters. And what I would leave on that message, get involved and take your time to research your candidate because it just might pay off and maybe can't make the place better until everybody gets involved. That's wonderful. Sir, I'm gonna leave that as our final thought. Thank you so much uh, again, and I wish you continued blessings um, as, as you do this job, no matter who gets in the race, this is, that's a hard gig. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, uh, just know that that, you know, the regular folks are out here praying for the best for our country and the best for our fellow citizens. Have a beautiful evening. You too. Thank you, sir. Right. Good night. Good night. Share your story on the Colors of Sound podcast. Our mission is to create a safe space for community members from around the world to share their unique stories. Do you have an interesting story to share or perhaps a journey of triumph from a challenge that you faced? Do you want the world to know about your talent? Visit our website and complete our guest intake form at WDON1204.com. The Colors of Sound podcast. Discover how much we have in common.